Okay, so hello everyone. Um, we will be covering sprints 86 and 87 today. To get started, we have our team slides and we do have a couple of new uh, project team members. So on the core functional team, um, we have Daniel Trin, who is a new developer from University of Colorado in Boulder and Kyle Felker from Grand Valley State University. So we're super excited to have them on the project and on the team. So welcome guys. And then I saw we had another couple of new folks on FullyJet, I think it was, yes. So on FullyJet, we um, have uh, Ivan joining and William Welling um, from Texas A&M are both joining FullyJet now. So welcome guys, glad to have you. And those were the only two new folks that I saw. Um, we do now have a slide for the Thor team. This is the index data team that was working on course reserves before, um, but they've been renamed Thor. And um, you can see that they will be working on Z3950 as well um, as the course reserves um, app that they built. And Charlotte Witt is their PO. All right. so. I think that's all we need to say about teams. This brings us to Jakob's slides. Are you on, Jakob? I am. Thanks, Kate. Sure thing. This will be a very, very quick update. Um, as most of you guys seen, uh, uh, as it was announced on the releases channeled by Anton, our QA lead, uh, we have the um, we have the Flame Flower Helpix release out. Um, it was out on May first. Um, and it addressed about 50, uh, 50 or so um, issues that were uh, found during the Buckfest, um, uh, the subsequent Buckfest um, um, uh, testing process, and were not uh, were not uh, were not addressed in the initial release. So that public release is out now, um, and uh, I just like to thank everybody who's been involved in making this happen. Uh, so great work, guys. Um, we may release some additional individual hotfixes for selected modules, uh, depending on the severity of issues. Uh, we would be focusing on things that are critical to performance, stability, and security uh, that we do so. So similar to the previous releases. Um, and we have a process summary here. I think I've been going to that process uh, a couple of times already, so, uh, so I'll just skip it for now. And Kate, if you could please Switch to the next slide. Did it update for you? It actually hasn't. Oh, no, it hasn't. Oh. Thank you. Um, just a quick update about the Golden Road uh, release timeline. Uh, it is a preliminary release timeline, but it's unlikely to change at this point. We've went through this on the, excuse me, we went through this on the previous uh, sprint review. Um, uh, sort of the main difference this time around is that we have a uh, API freeze uh, for the platform, uh, which is sort of much sooner uh, in the quarter uh, before the actual module release deadline. Uh, this is to ensure that uh, uh, that there's time, there's lead time uh, for individual teams to update their dependencies um, uh, to those dependencies that will be released as part of the API uh, freeze. Um, and, and that API freeze, for the most part, uh, concerns copy stripes and RMB, so those, uh, so those low-level platform components. Uh, this timeline will be extended with additional um, milestones. Um, uh, we have a release coordinator uh, on the project, a dedicated release coordinator this time around, Alexi Petrenko. Uh, so he's working on uh, making sure that the process can be as smooth as possible and setting up uh, a, a tracking project for the release activities. Um, and he will be um, explaining and, 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 and discussing the, the release timeline uh, in more detail um, on the Scrum of Scrum meetings. So, so I'll leave it to him um, to go through those details, but we will be seeing some additional uh, checkpoints along the way to make sure that the, uh, that the dependency updates are in place um, and that the teams uh, are successful in um, in uh, executing 
those uh, those milestones along the, uh, the release timeline. Um, I think that's it. If you guys have any questions, please ping me as usual. Um, over to you guys. All right. Thanks, Jakob. Thank you. Uh, all right. So, uh, as usual, we have um, each team's sprint highlights here in the slides if you're interested in taking a look at the details. But we're just going to jump straight to the demos. So, when we get there, there we go. All right. So, we will kick it under Jet and Dennis. And let me stop sharing so you can take over. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, just wanted to mention before we get into the demo, in the last few sprints, uh, the team, our Thunderjet team, has gone through some significant changes. I want to give some kudos just to the team members, both past and present, for their focus and open communications made it possible to stay productive through major transitions in the team. Special thanks to Alexei Chukov, Andre Makareka, Slava, Kendrami, and Craig McNally for all their technical leadership. Um, like many other teams here, I'm sure we've been focusing the past two months on, you know, stability and delivery bug fixes for the Q1 release. But amidst that, we've also been working on finishing uh, a few of the CAP MVP features that were split from Q1. So a lot of important work going on here in today's demo. We're going to focus on one of those particular features, and that is basically the generating of of batch vouchers and exporting of those vouchers. So these vouchers collect together all the financial data from what's been invoiced, basically, and they prepare it to be shared with an external financial system. So I'm going to hand things over to Alexi, and he is hopefully ready to share his screen and to take us through um, creating batch groups. Make sure your invoices are assigned to those batch groups, because uh, there could be many and then showing how those groups are, uh, all the invoices are collected as batches for those groups and they can be exported. So I'll turn things over to Alexi. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Thank you for the kind words. So first of all, I'm going to show you batch groups. Uh, earlier we uh, demonstrated uh, adding them and managing. They leave, uh, leaves, they leave in settings, uh, invoices, batch groups. Uh, here we have some. And uh, now when we go to, to the invoice app, we can assign them uh, to the invoice. So let me add the form and uh, we have uh, appropriate, uh, I mean, corresponding uh, controls it's select since this invoice is paid uh, we can't change the group uh, basically uh, when you create a new invoice you can select any of, of it uh, by default we have folio predefined for uh, base group and uh, if uh, none are created uh, uh, it will be assigned by default and uh, this select will be disabled. So I have two invoices. Uh, this one was already exported and this one uh, no. Uh, they assigned to appropriate batch group. Uh, so let's go to the settings and I, I can show you the next thing. Uh, run the voucher export manually. Uh, for uh, Batch group configuration, we can select uh, our group. And uh, basically, we have button just one uh, run manual export. It will bring you confirmation model that it will export all vouchers uh, from the previous uh, export till, till now. So by clicking uh, continue, we'll get uh, our list. Uh, with uh, exports. Uh, so for now, uh, I think we will continue to work on this to update uh, list 
by uh, some mechanism, but for now it's generated. It takes some time because it's page process on the backend. And here we have uh, the next thing. Uh, it's uh, it's download batch vouchers. Basically, we have a button for uh, that batch export, uh, and we can click on it. Save. Uh, it will save as JSON. Uh, but of course, so we can uh, actually we can export in XML format. So uh, let me click save, click export, and here we have basically our exported uh, batch voucher in XML. Uh, so these are files, and we can re-upload them if needed. Uh, apart from that, uh, we have uh, implemented test voucher setting uh, for FTP connection. It means that uh, we have uh, setting uh, where we need to upload. Uh, and uh, we have credentials for that server. So for now, I've configured uh, this for mm, folio testing FTP server. So by clicking test connection, uh, backend uh, call uh, returns as a result, like if it's okay. And uh, I prepared one group with configured uh, wrong credentials. Uh, so we will see another uh, result. Uh, basically, that's it. Uh, as far as I know, we continue to work on improving uh, and uh, uh, to export our files to FTP. So maybe it would be demonstrated later. Thanks. Thanks, Alexi. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks very much, Alexi. Yep. Okay, uh, Firebird is up next um, with Stephanie. Hi there. So um, we will be showing uh, what we've done so far with QuickMark. Um, just a couple things about QuickMark. It is a mark editing tool. Um, it is not a full cataloging tool and that's a really important distinction to keep in mind when we look at the functionality. And also um, we're working on some refinements on the front end and we expect the back end to be connected this week. So if you go in to play with QuickMark, any changes that you make to records are not going to be saved right now. We're still putting those connections together. Um, and I also would like to uh, give a shout out to the whole Fullajet team for working with us on this uh, since we worked within inventory um, to make this happen. And with that, I'll hand it over to Makita. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And uh, let me share my screen. This one. And uh, I believe you see inventory. Uh, and here we have. Uh, so before the demo, I imported uh, a mark record and um, in inventory, we have in, uh, an instance with uh, metadata source mark. And uh, for such uh, sources, we have a new action editing quick mark. This action is available only for uh, mark source and uh, in case uh, there is a permission uh, for this action. So let's open this. And uh, here we see uh, the form uh, that uh, represents uh, mark record, uh, one row for uh, each uh, record field. Uh, and uh, as for 008 field, uh, it's, uh, it's broken by bytes. Uh, and uh, it's different, uh, depends on, on record type. 
so uh, it depends on uh, type and uh, the level values. Uh, additionally, here we can uh, move uh, new new fields or remove existing, and uh, we can uh, uh, fields can be moved up or moved down. Um, actually, full edit process. Um, yeah, let's add some additional uh, changes. And uh, record can be saved. So uh, this section works on client side, uh, but uh, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, it's not connected. Uh, it's not fully connected. So we can, uh, yeah. Uh, let me uh, remove some of my empties. Um, additional. Uh, uh, so I assume something is wrong with uh, backend and uh, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, it's not fully connected and uh, I believe uh, we'll demo this uh, next time uh, when and uh, uh, appear in SRS. And uh, that's it for me, thank you. Great, it's looking good you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Foley Jet and Anne Marie. Hi. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, I uh, I stole the demo today from the developers because basically everything that I'm going to show is stuff that all the developers have worked on to make happen. And like the other teams that have talked this this past two sprints has been tons of bug fixes and then also staff changes. So shout out to Yvonne, who is our new um, UI lead uh, replacement for someone who rotated off the project. And then also William Welling, who was on loan from Texas A&M for this quarter to help with the uh, performance related stuff that folks are uh, have have logged and talked about for source records. Um, <clears throat> so last sprint review, we we showed a, a, a bit of what I'm going to show today, but hopefully it's all going to work properly, although I may have just jinxed it. The the point of data import is to be able to take files of various types starting with MARC bibliographic files, load them into Folio and have them act on various types of records in Folio. So in Q1, we have made it so that um, you can load a MARC file, it will create the source MARC record and it will create instances, holdings and items. And it will create those with customized mappings that will extract data from the MARC records and put it in the proper places in those types of records. Q2, we're working on updates for those record types. And then Q3, we'll start working on the acquisitions record types, so orders and invoices. But I'm going to start with a MARC file. And it's been nice to have Steph and Magda and their teams who also are MARC people, um, because there's, there's a few more of us now. So this is a MARC file that I'm about to import. It's, uh, it's not a bunch of records, but it's got um, call numbers here in the 050. This library, if they want to do something different with a call number, they put that in the 090 field. So in their um, instructions, when I'm building the uh, holdings record, I prefer the 090 call number if it's there. Otherwise, I fall back to the 050 call number. Also, if the, the thing is large, they have oversized shelving, which is often called folio, no relation to the project shelving in the library. And that's what this subfield PF, that's their designation that this is going to go into oversized shelving. This record also has toward the bottom, it has a barcode number. So that will go in the item record. There's some order and invoice data here in the 980, which we're going to ignore for now. And then there's a 
uh, volume designation that's going to go in the item record as well. So I'm going to go back to Folio now and I'm going to go to settings. And this is where we finally put all the pieces together. So in the job profile that I'm going to use, we have, it, it consists of a match profile, which we'll take a look at in a second. And if matches are made, you stop, you don't go any further. We're expecting with this file not to get any matches. So if there's a match, that's a problem. For non-matches, you keep going. And in those cases, you're gonna create an instance, create a holding and create an item record from that incoming mark record. The action profiles, these, well, actually, let me show you the match profile first. The match profile is, um, basically set up to fail. So it's not the type of match profile you would probably ever build on a, on a real import, but um, for the match profile, you have what is the incoming record type and what kind of record am I trying to match to? So in this case, incoming mark bib, trying to match to an instance. And I'm trying to match the 022 field, which is the ISSN for folks that are used to mark um, against the instance HRID field. So those are never gonna match. So I, I guarantee false matches. With the match, we can match any field in the mark record to any field in the instance record. Usually it's gonna be some type of identifier. And I can qualify. I, I just wanna to match to identifiers that have like an OCLC prefix to them. Or I can say, I just wanna compare the numbers and ignore any of the alphas and, and um, special characters that might be there. It can exactly match, it can match the beginning or it can match the end. So you have a lot of flexibility with the match. The action profiles are really straightforward. They consist of a verb and a record type. So create folio holdings, create folio instances, create folio items. And the most interesting part are these field mapping profiles, which are gonna tell the system what to do with the data that's gonna be used. So let me start with an instance. In the instance, I'm gonna go into edit mode here. Incoming record type is mark bib. I want it to create an instance and all of the default mark to instance mappings, those all still apply. So we don't have to map title into the right place or publisher into the right place. This is basically mapping the edges of the record that are not covered by mark. So in the instance, there are three checkboxes um, for suppressed from discovery, staff suppressed, and previously held. And in the mapping profile, we have turned those into dropdowns so that you can say, I wanna uh, mark everything that's coming in. I wanna unmark everything, uncheck everything. Or if this were an update, I wanna keep the existing values. I don't wanna affect the checkbox. So I'm gonna leave it as mark. Catalog date. We, we've taken some of these field mappings and we've done special things to the, to the way that the field mappings work. But in general, this is gonna look a lot like the create edit screen for the instance. So catalog date is a date picker type field. And because this is a mapping profile that I may use over time, I can map in just today's date and it'll always pick up what is today's date. Or I can say, no, I wanna choose a date and then it'll give me the little date picker and I can pick a date. So data can come from the record itself or it can be defaulted in. And this is a good example of data that's been defaulted into the profile. Anything that creates an instance with this profile is gonna assign a catalog date of May 1st, 2020. Um, the rest of the instance is controlled by the default mark to instance map. So nothing too interesting there. For the holdings, we have, uh, this is where we're still fixing things. So you should see the location name or the location code or both here in the location for the defaulted location. You should see Library of Congress for the call number type. Um, the drop down list here shows you what those options are. Um, they're not working quite right. So for now we have the UUID for the annex and the UUID for Library of Congress. So again, these are default information. Over here is where you get the first data that we're getting from the mark record. So for the call number in the holdings record, this is saying, look first to see if there's anything in the 090, and if so, put the 090 A and B, 
in the call number field separated by a space. If not, that's where the else comes in. Use the 050 A and B separated by a space. So we have a fallback for the things that don't have 090s. And if there is an 090 subfield P, put that into the suffix field of the holdings record. We have a Will Lind ILL policy and that's holdings. And then item record, real quickly. We have the barcode coming in from 949A. We have material type of book. And again, we want the actual value of book to show, not the UUID, but that's next print. And we have the volume number coming from 993A if it exists. And we have loan type of uh, can circulate and status of available. So we put all of those together into a job profile and then this is what happens when I go to load the file. So we have this secret button over here for a long time which um, does not use PubSub. It only creates instances and mark bibs. It doesn't do matching or any kind of custom mappings. Um, but it's been a really good kind of stand, uh, useful thing while we were getting the rest of it ready. For this one though, I wanna use PubSub and I wanna create the holdings and items in addition to the instances. So I'm gonna pick that test job profile. I'm gonna run that profile and it's gonna load that mark file. It's gonna do, attempt to do the matches. The matches are gonna fail. It's gonna create uh, mark bibs, instances, holdings, and items. And if I look at the log for that, I can grab my instance ID and I can jump over to inventory. So here's the instance that was just created. If I click on it, here's my holdings record that was created and my item record that were cre was created. And in my holdings, I've got Library of Congress classification, location of annex, Here's my call number from the 090 and the call number suffix of F and my ILL policy in my item record. Here is my barcode number, yay, and my material type designation, my volume number down here in the volume field, and my loan type and my item status. So I loaded the file and it created not just the instances, but the holdings and the items with the mappings that we had requested. So that's, that's what we've been working toward for, I don't know, a year now <laughs> with data import. And we've, we've got the pieces in place now to make it all work. So that's, that's it for me. Awesome, Anne-Marie, that seems like a really huge milestone. It looks really cool yes. to see that end to end. Great. Well, thank you. And with that, we can move to um, Vega with Alex to start out. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Can you see the screen? Yes. We can hear you and see the screen. Okay, so today I'm going to show you or do find notices. And or do find notices are scheduled notices, meaning that they're stored in the database to be sent at a later point in time. And unfortunately, there's no way to see the queue of scheduled notices in the UI. So I'm going to have to rely on an API tool to show you what's going on behind the scenes. So currently, there are no scheduled notices uh, in the queue for my test user, and my inbox is currently empty. So I have a loan that's uh, well overdue by now. And um, once I check the item back in, and overdefined should be created according to the circulation rules. And uh, patron notice policy also defined in the same rule. Uh, this one uh, should be applied uh, to the loan. 
Now this policy is set up to create three overdefined notices. One of them should be sent uh, immediately once the overdefined is charged. Uh, the other one should be sent one minute after um, the fine is charged and it's, uh, it's a one-time notice, meaning that it will be sent and deleted right after the, the, the delivery. And the third one is set up to be sent one minute after an overdue fine is charged. And it's a recurring one, meaning that it will be rescheduled to be sent two minutes after that and then two minutes after that and so on. So once I check the item back in, as I said, an overdefined should be created, hopefully. Yeah, if he finds owned. Yeah, an overdefined is created. And if we take a look at the queue, three notices were scheduled. And now these are exactly the notices I shown you before, these three. Now um, the scheduled notices, notices processing runs every couple of minutes. So while we are waiting for those notices, I will show you how everything is set up. First of all, you're gonna need your templates. Of course, I have three templates, one for each uh, over the notice uh, configured. And they are pretty much identical. They just differ in the email subject. Uh, then you need your patron notice policy. This is the one I've shown you before with three notices configured. Of course, so you're gonna need your overdefined policy uh, to be able to charge those overdefines and a circulation rule that includes um, both your uh, overdue fine policy and patron notice policy. And there they are, the three notices, one for upon at timing, or one time notice scheduled to be sent after the overdue fine is charged and the recurrent notice um, that was sent after the fine was charged. Now, if we take a look at the patron notices queue, you can see that there's only one left, the one that was sent and rescheduled to be sent later. And it's gonna keep doing that up until the point that um, the fine charged is closed. So for example, if I if I close it, then during the next um, or the fine notice is processing, this notice was, will just be discarded and deleted. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, that looks like complex stuff to develop and test. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and do we also have Anna from Vega doing a demo today? Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm sharing my screen. Let me know when you see it. I don't see it yet. And now? Yes, yes. there it is. Uh, so let's go to settings, uh, users. Um, our team was um, created a new section of user settings uh, pattern blocks. Uh, there are two pages, conditions and limits. Uh, here will be presented only UI part of pattern blocks. Let's go to conditions. Uh, here we can see the list of conditions uh, which um, are already existed uh, on backend side, so we cannot create or delete it uh, on UI. Um, for every condition, we have uh, the form to set up um, the set up every condition. So 
uh, if um, at least one of checkboxes uh, is selected, uh, the message becomes uh, required and um, vice versa. If we uh, feel the message, uh, one of the checkboxes uh, should be selected. I guess that's, uh, that's it with conditions. Let's go to limits part. So here we can see the list of um, existed pattern blocks, uh, gr or pattern groups. And for each pattern group, uh, here we can see the, the, lift, uh, the list of uh, conditions which we uh, were see before. So for every condition we can uh, set uh, different uh, limits and um, all of them of, are ju uh, just uh, some of uh, conditions uh, and also here is the validation um, that the value must be more than zero. In this case it should be just uh, empty field and no more than uh, 99 thousands and um, separate um, validations the message we have for uh, only we find balance condition mm, i guess that's all from viga thank you for your attention if you have uh, any question please uh, ask or contact me in slack Great. Thanks, Anna. Looking good. Uh, okay, so Concord is next with Kruthi to start. Hello. Uh, just share my screen. Uh, do you see it? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, processes for uh, data export is uh, storing the exported uh, generated exported files into a uh, object storage. Uh, the current state of uh, data export is that we are ex uh, we are storing all the files in AWS S3 and that is the only supported uh, storage solution. So we wanted to come up with a uh, platform agnostic solution where uh, irrespective of how or where Folio is hosted, we will be able to store the files. So uh, we've considered a few, few options. Uh, everything is listed in the wiki. Uh, today I will just discuss one of the options that seem promising to us, uh, which is Minio. Uh, it's an object so storage solution that can be run on a, a bare metal or a, a NAS infrastructure or even on the cloud. Um, so if we chose to uh, host Folio in a cloud, uh, Minio can act as a gateway to it. Um, and otherwise, if you're storing it on the prem, uh, Minio server could be set up with any of the persistent uh, storage as the backend. Um, so I'll uh, show a quick demo um, of how this works. Um, so Minio also provides a CLI and a UI, and this is how it looks. Uh, currently, I'm running Minio on my local on a Docker container. Um, so this is a small piece of code um, where I'm trying to export a file to Minio. Um, so here is the file that is generated. So this can uh, this can generate a pre-signed URL, uh, which can directly be imported uh, and downloaded from our UI. Uh, that's what we're doing right now. And without any code changes, I can just send in the credentials of uh, AWS and store the same file uh, in AWS as well. So, uh, so this is the file that it has stored. So without any of the code changes, the same thing, we can just send in the credentials of uh, Azure or uh, any other storage that we uh, decide to use um, can, uh, uh, can be uh, used as a gateway using Minio. Um, 
the other advantages is that it provides an S3 compatible API. So, so that any that that's how it supports uh, multiple backends. Um, so this is uh, one of the promising options. And uh, if you have any other uh, questions, please feel free to uh, drop it in the uh, in our wiki page uh, or any other suggestions. Um, that's all I have. Thanks, Kruthi. Uh, looks like Igor is next. Hello, I'm sharing. Uh, do you see? Yeah. yeah. So uh, on this demo, I want to show uh, the loan uh, evaded functionality for data export. This is about uh, generating mark bibliographic records for incoming inventory instances. So uh, at first, let me just show how it looks like on reference environment. And then I will, I will quickly explain how it works and how it happens behind the magic on UI. So first of all, I would like to open up inventory application and let's try to uh, find some inventory instance with uh, metadata source equal to folio. Uh, well, my favorite one is semantic web primer. So let's just quickly export it. Uh, at this moment, data export creates a mark file with only one record in for the given inventory instance. So generating uh, happens like on the fly without saving result in database. And the only file is final destination. Let's just download it and open it up with Mark Editor. So, I would like to validate the file before uh, working with it to make sure the structure of record is correct and to make sure this is the real mark file. So the mark editor shows that no errors were responded, uh, were reported. Uh, so let's just break it in the fields uh, just to see the structure. <clears throat> So here is it generated records I was talking about. Uh, I see the mark leader. I see uh, human readable ID that stays that stays uh, near 001 field. I see the resource title in 245, and the record looks as expected itself. So uh, what about? Uh, what about the mechanism that is responsible to generate such mark records? Uh, the mechanism relies on default mapping rules. That is just a JSON file. So the mapping rule just describes the way how, how to take data from incoming object, from inventory instance, and how to put it to the target mark uh, record. And, uh, at this moment, uh, only developers can update this file. And uh, we expand this file over time to cover more and more fields. And in future, in future releases, we plan to make the rules uh, to be tenant specific itself and provide the REST API uh, to let the end users, to let librarians modify rules 
in a manner they want to. So this is how it works like in general in general terms. I'm done. Thanks for watching. Thanks for attention. Thanks, Igor. A uh, quick question. I missed um, how you triggered the export. So you did you select the item in the inventory and then click something? Uh, no, I just prepared the file before starting the demo. Ah, OK. Yeah. OK. All right, thank you. So, um, Andre is next from Concord. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? Hello. Yep, uh, please let me know if you can see Postman. Yes, we can. Okay, so in, in the last iteration, Concord team expanded existing Postman API test and currently in co it covers all our endpoints. Uh, and today I will show you the running of the test at the snapshot environment. Uh, so as you can see, the calls will go, will go to the snapshot environment. Uh, and some notes about what we are testing here. We are testing file upload functionality, checking does export process pass successfully, does provided file with UIDs is in correct CC format, uh, does a created file name contain job execution, human readable ID and stuff like that. So let's run the test. You can see the progress bar here. Just need to wait one minute. Hmm. Well, let's try to run test this testing environment, maybe some problems with some shot. Andre, we don't see anything on our screen. We just see the postman. Are you running them? Yes. Uh, the, the message says this collection is not linked to any API. Do you need to select the environment maybe? I select the environment and uh, you don't see my screen. Uh, <laughs> the tests are already finished. Just wait a second. Do you see it? No? Yes. Okay, so let's uh, retry the running of the test. Oh, we need to wait one, one minute before we can uh, start it. So I will try it again with the proton environment. Snapshot doesn't want to work today. <laughs> Let's try testing environment again. Uh, 
I think we can revisit the API test later, maybe. Yep, I don't think this is a problem with API test. It works a couple of minutes ago, <laughs> but, but yeah. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you, Andre. Thank you. We'll check in next time. Okay, Stripes Force is up with John Coburn. All right, Hi, John. Me. Hi there, I'm here. There Let me are. share my screen. Okay, sharing my screen. Uh, do you guys see the inventory UI in the browser? Yep, we see it. All right, so uh, today uh, uh, I have to show you guys a feature we're very excited about. Um, Stripes Force is the uh, the resizable panes feature, um, uh, something that's come of necessity with our our uh, data dense displays is the need to uh, sometimes adjust your your layout and your of your panes uh, within Folio. So I'm here in inventory, and I'm just gonna uh, grab some grab a search result of some some main library records here. Uh, so you'll be able to see on, I'll just open up so I can get a couple of different panes up here uh, to show you. Uh, so, uh, so the feature allows me to, uh, if I hover over the edge of one of the panes in the, in the layout pane set, I can just, uh, I didn't quite get it. Sorry. Good job. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm dragging, it's like a little dotted line that I'm dragging. So when I drop that line, uh, the details pane will resize nicely for me. Um, and you can shrink the other panes as well. Um, so uh, the way that this actually works uh, within the, the pane set is it will sort of keep track of, of this, uh, these particular widths uh, while you have this set of panes um, up. So so for instance, you know, I have three panes up right now and I've kind of sized things the way that I like them with a larger detail record. Um, and so it'll retain that while I, while I browse around and, and look, at my, look at some different records. Um, and then whenever I close my, uh, my detail record, so it'll bring me back to this two pane view and maybe in this sense, maybe in this particular context, I want to, uh, give myself a wider search and filter pane. So uh, we can operate there. And then once I go back to a three pane setup, uh, click on one of these guys, you can see it returned to that other, other layout for me. So uh, just, uh, just an illustration of just how resizable panes work and how it, uh, it can really help help us uh, have our UI be, be comfortable for the users. Uh, had a number of people help me uh, with this feature. Uh, so this feature is, is folio wide. If you're using uh, Stripes components, panes and pane sets, uh, then you have resizable panes. Um, uh, so, you know, everywhere from, from checkout with its dual panes, uh, inventory, users, uh, everybody has this feature now. Um, let's see, uh, another, uh, detail, uh, well, another piece of the, uh, development of this is that, uh, an app can, uh, set its, the width of its panes, uh, from the app level. So, so before you only had control, uh, uh, the first time that a pane renders, uh, by setting sort of a default width for it uh, uh, to be set. Uh, but now you could, so you could, for instance, um, say that, well, my, my search and filter pane is open. So in that, in that instance, I want to have uh, my detail record, you know, be wider than my results pane or, you know, to, to kind of use the space uh, more efficiently. 
Uh, so, so it's possible uh, to apply that. Um, and you can, and uh, developers and everybody, they can check out the documentation within Stripe's components uh, for the pain set component, actually. And it describes all the new features, the new features that have been added and uh, gives you some example code for how to set these up uh, in your application. Uh, special thanks to some of the people who helped me get it across the board. Uh, uh, Victor Soraka, Mark Deutsch, uh, Michael Kuklis, Zach Burke uh, for, for all their help along the way with it. Um, and of course, everybody who kind of helped make the decision and prioritize to push this forward, Kate and Kalila and everybody. So that's what I got today. Thanks, everybody. Very cool, John. People have been asking for this feature for so long. It's amazing to see it working. You're getting tons of kudos in the chat here. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Thank you all. Okay, and now to our last dev team, Core Functional, starting out with Sergey. Thank you, Kate. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm going to start from the new feature in user's application. This is the first step in developing functionality for assigning fees to items when they are declared lost based on the library's lost item <coughs> fee policies for the item. Uh, we have a pattern, Aaron Ibeck, and we have open loans for him. One, uh, and one loan is uh, on the item to which uh, the policy, lost item fee policy demo is assigned. Uh, let's look at this policy. And uh, please pay attention to the following settings in this policy, charge amount for item set cost of zero and uh, lost item processing fee uh, set to zero as well. Uh, in other words, we are now looking at a scenario in which the pattern will not be fined for losing an item when declare this item lost. Let's check it out. And uh, we will go to, to the open loans for this pattern and declare this item lost. After confirm, Yes. After confirm, the, the loan automatically becomes closed. And as you can see, uh, there are no fee fines uh, to the, to, for this pattern. And uh, the uh, next feature I'd like to show is here in the user application. You can see another open loan with item status claim returned. Uh, in action menu, uh, you can see the option mark as missing. After clicking, we'll get uh, on model window with title, with uh, text uh, that this item will be marked missing. And uh, with our reg regular button cancel and confirm after after confirm button. Uh, 
loan status changed to closed and uh, in in loan de de details for that item we can see that uh, item status changed from claim returned to missing that's all about your uh, users application and now i'm going to i'm going to go ahead and move to inventory application i will show you the functionality which is called mark an item as withdraw uh, the mark as withdrawn action can be applied to the items uh, with statuses in process uh, available in transit awaiting pickup awaiting delivery missing and paged and cannot be applied for statuses uh, in order checked out with uh, claim return declare closed and uh, obviously withdrawn for our example uh, let's take the item with status awaiting pickup and also we have a request for this item I'm going to show you uh, with status awaiting pickup, open awaiting pickup. This is a request for this item, open awaiting pickup. Uh, and let's return to inventory. Sorry. And here is this item with status awaiting pickup. And in drop down menu, we can see the option mark as withdrawn. We uh, click on this option and <coughs> sorry. <laughs> After that, we go to the model window with title, with uh, our text that this item will be marked as withdrawn with our cancel and confirm button. After clicking confirm, the item status changed to withdrawn. And the item now is available when filtering with withdrawn option. Here it is. And request status on this item. Uh, change to open not filled yet. Here is this item, and this is uh, the status uh, request status for this item. Uh, the next uh, feature is about normalizing, normalizing ISBN uh, when using the uh, when we're using the ISBN normalized searching option. Here it is. It works in all three segments, instance, holdings, and item. Uh, the requirements for the implementation of this feature were to have the ability to search by ISBN numbers among the identifier types uh, as ISBN and invalid ISBN uh, with 10 digits and 13 digits ISBN number with and without spaces, with and without dashes, with and without qualifier data after number. For a demo, I prepared a pretty strange invalid ISBN. Here it is. Uh, with uh, this has been with redundant spaces, dashes, and qualifier. And uh, using the ISBN option and knowing the order of all digits in this ISBN number, it's possible to find the instance with such an identifier. I remember one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, oh. And when we can see uh, this 
ID in here with invalid identifier. And you can see that it's invalid. In, in another instance, uh, it's found in ISBN, uh, identifier type. Uh, for comparison, this set of number will not give the result in the search by ISBN. And uh, by keyword, only ISBN normalized option does work here. And the last feature in my today's demo is the ability to filter instance records by date updated. Yeah. Uh, this is very uh, similar to the filter on instance, instances uh, by date created, which was demoed in the last demo session. Uh, I'm gonna remind you how it works uh, after entering the start uh, data date in uh, the first field for example today's date and entering the end date after clicking apply button then in, in the result pane, we get instance records. And uh, it's updates, it's date update, updated date matches to the range of entered dates. And that's, that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Sergey, a question? Yeah, Sergey. Um, I think that it, for that date filter, you you have to fill in the from and to dates, right? You can't just do one or the other. Uh, the first, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can use, uh, uh, for example, yesterday's days, and the searching will be happen. Uh, by two day two days right but like i can't leave from or i can't leave too blank and have everything from yesterday to this very moment but i i can't leave either date field blank is that right uh do you want to uh, uh delete this uh record y yeah I, I think this works the same way as some of the other date filters where yeah you can't you can't leave the beginning or end date blank yeah we 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 can't we can't leave this uh, data blank we need to uh, fill this uh, fields uh, it's a validation method uh, right. defined what well, one of these days i think that'll be a good enhancement for this this little filter component that you can say everything up to a certain date or everything after a certain date by you know by leaving one or the other of those fields blank mm. but yeah I, I i'm not sure i'm not sure that i understand you that's, correctly. that's okay can... that's okay it's just it, we, we use this date filter a lot in some of the other apps i work with and yeah it it it's a constraint that you have to fill in both dates. So maybe yeah. one day we can make it so you can only fill in, only have to fill in one date. Mm, maybe, but uh, we are using here the component. Right, the uh, central component. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a library it's component good. and each component has uh, their validation. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's the same component as used in the orders. Yep. So we are. So, yeah. uh, it should be if we want to change that. When then we need to change the component. Yeah. yeah. One of these days, I think we need to change the central component. I I just didn't. Yeah. I just wanted to check and see if it was working the same way. So, good to know. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Sergey. 
Okay, and then Matt Connolly is up. Hi, all. Hello. Okay, so I won't keep you too long here. I've just got a few quick things to show off. Um, I'm going to start in inventory, where we've made a couple of uh, small tweaks to how certain dates are displayed um, in the uh, instance and item record views. So down here, we've got instance status term, which uh, is an event that has a date associated with it. And previously, the date at which whatever event that was happened was uh, over here by itself in one of these uh, separate fields. And we've moved it down here now so that it's associated, the, the date itself is associated with the event. So if I go in here and just edit this record and say it's been cataloged, save and close, then we get our uh, correct date and time associated with the cataloged event. And the same thing has been done for item records. So I've, we've got one here that's been checked out. And if I just look at this, um, here we've got, I noticed just before the meeting, there's a slight problem. Uh, for some reason, this date is coming as, as invalid, but we've done basically the same thing here. So we have the item status and then the uh, date that that status was changed, now associated with the record, where before I believe it was in this area right here. That's the Safari bug, Matt. Is that a Safari bug? Okay. Interesting. Long story. <laughs> All right. I, I guess I should not use Safari for demos then. Um, thanks, Zach. So next up, um, I'm going to look again at, at withdrawn records. So here I have an item record that's been withdrawn. And um, as part of the work for withdrawn items, uh, this has been enabled in checkout, the ability to, uh, to, with, to check out items that have this status. So if I just try to put in this item here, now I get a, a pop-up asking if, I, if, I want, if I'm sure I want to, with, uh, to check out this thing that has been withdrawn. And if it also has been suppressed, that will show up in the, the message text here as well. But either way, I can now go ahead and just confirm that and I get a regular checkout. All right, and then finally, I'm going to move over to users. And again, I'm going to revisit something you heard about from Sergey, the uh, declared lost items here. Um, in this case, we have a user who has three items checked out. Um, two of them are regular checkouts, but one has been declared lost. And I'm gonna look at the change due date function for this. So if I select all three of these items and then go into the change due date dialog, um, you can see here it's telling me that the declared lost item is in fact declared lost. There's a warning about that, but I can still go ahead and try to um, adjust the uh, due date for all three of them. And so previously the behavior of this was that if I, if I were to hit save and close now, it would try to process the uh, due date change for all three items, but then it would take me back to this same dialog box. Um, again, with an alert saying that you couldn't check out the uh, declared lost item, but also the other two items wouldn't have been checked out or, or wouldn't have been uh, updated either. Um, and you'd have to deselect the declared lost item and just uh, try to save and close again with the regular items. Now this has been, um, the behavior has been changed so that if I hit save and close, um, it tells me that uh, the declared lost item could not have its state changed, um, but the other two have been successfully changed. And uh, I got a summary up there as well with that information. Uh, and that's it for my end. Great, thank you, Matt. Okay, so those were all the demos we had. Um, so I can hand it over now to Anton to give the QA update. You want to take over? There you are. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, so the usual slide uh, on coverage, not a lot of um, 
changes here, even though Stripe components are creeping up to uh, our desired 80%, which is a great news. Um, also, you, uh, UI inventory and, and UI users fixed um, prob uh, so uh, core functional fixed uh, coverage problems. And we uh, uh, can see the coverage numbers um, back again. So that being said, um, uh, there are several problems with the coverage that we have in different modules. So UI, UI data import and e-holdings uh, dropped um, reporting a while ago. And I encourage this team to reach out to core functional because they did a lot of work to make the test to pass reliably. So I would, I encourage you to uh, reach out and see if uh, guys can help you to fix your tests. Now UI checkout just dipped um, slightly below 80%. So I just want to keep things clean and if someone can take a look at that. And the other um, a point that I'll, I would like to make, so we have a new module called, called UI courses and it was released without any unit tests and this is um, i can understand where we're trading time for quality but at the same time this is not something that we should tolerate for very long time so i expect this to be fixed in this quarter because everybody's holding themselves accountable uh, for 80 percent of code coverage and I don't think we, we can afford any exceptions uh, here. So um, also the, the above is the link to quality dashboard. It's been updated. So if you're interested, there's few interest, uh, interesting updates on performance testing um, and, thing, uh, and uh, integration testing, things like that. So now to cheer you up a little bit, I created the aging defects dashboard um, because, well, I don't know about you, but I'm always being depressed by number of bugs that we accumulated and uh, there's kind of no way out of it, but on the positive side. On the left side is a graph of unresolved defects that, uh, that group by their age. So what you can see here that um, the third of those bugs are about uh, more than a year old. So what we should do, we should just triage those bugs and try to close, close them off. And the other interesting fact is that if you see this outline stack, which is second from the left, from the right, uh, this is how many bugs, it's almost 200 bugs that were created in the Q1. And one of the major contributors to that was that we start using larger data set for testing and it exposed a lot of issues. And this is when things got, um, uh, got kind of blown up. But at the same time, if you look at the um, right graph, it only takes you no more than two sprint to fix issues. So our processing power is pretty good, uh, is my first point. And the second point, we just drag a lot of issues that we're probably never gonna fix. So we're just gonna triage them and close them down. So that being said, for, this is an example of uh, what bugs we have um, that are, more than uh, more than a year old, so it's a practically third of our um, of the bugs that we have unresolved and open at the moment. So um, I encourage you all to click on this link and go to the um, to the uh, to this dashboard, which has the same graphs and it also has grouping by thirty days old, ninety. 180, 270. And if product owners, tech leads, um, 
find some time and weed through the old bugs and just close them off as uh, no plan to fix. Or the other thing that I did, I created new issue type called technical debt. And if issue uh, classified as a bug, but not really a bug, but technical debt, then maybe you could move issue uh, these issues there. So basically, guys, I encourage you all find a little bit of time and prune your junk. Because I can't believe if we didn't find time to fix something for a year, that it could be extremely important or it could be hampering our system by a lot. So I can realize that the issues can be, um, uh, well, uh, valid. But at the same point, um, don't be too nitpick about it. And um, just uh, kind of use the common sense and see if it's something that can be moved to technical debt or it's something that doesn't make sense to fix at all. So, and prune them, prune them up so that we can have fewer issues in our total open bug count. So that's uh, pretty much all that I have for today. So if there are any questions. Not a question, I just wanted to add that um, I started, so um, Anton, Mark Johnson and I have kind of been working our way through some of those old bugs and thinking about what kinds of things we might want to keep, what kinds of things we might move to tech debt and so on. And we'll put together a wiki page that we can share um, with the POs and the tech leads. So they have a little bit of guidance around how to think about these things. But I will say just in, in the time that I've spent going through these old bugs, I've been able to close a lot already that just don't repro. I mean, they, they don't, if they're, you know, things change and a lot of things that are that old don't repro at all. So um, I think there's a lot of room for improvement with our bug backlog, just with cleanup. Um, yes, there were also a lot of uh, API, um, API tests, uh, failed API tests that could be closed because I think uh, if, if it's one year old, I think APIs run away from the state when the bug was filed. So. I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit just to clean up, um, uh, clean up the bug landscape and make our front side looks good. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. All right. Um, well, as always, we have in the deck um, what the teams are planning to work on for the coming sprint. So you can take a look at that if you'd like afterwards um but i think we can probably end five minutes early unless there's anything anyone wanted to ask or discuss all right thank you everyone for your demos and for listening and uh we'll post the recording peter murray will post the recording for us up on youtube shortly have a great rest of your day <laughs>